It's not going to give us a 45 minutes? No. It's two people now. If you're, a, if you're in a thing with two people. Oh, really? Is that what it was? We should be ready. Yeah, they just changed it. They just changed it up. We're rolling. We're rolling. All Nate, right. we're rolling. rolling. Quentin, we're rolling. rolling All right. Like Fred rolling. Durst. We're rolling like who? Fred Durst. Rolling, 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 rolling. <laughs> No, we're gonna we're gonna try to raise the bar here tonight, Nate. We're we're speaking with a jazz musician. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Frame This Podcast. I'm Philippe. My name's Nate. And with us today is Quentin Walston, a good friend from ya, ye old JMU School of Music. <laughs> Say hi to ye everyone, old. Quentin. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, really for those of us who don't know you, could you give us a brief bio um, of your, about sure, yourself yeah. Kind of uh, as Philip said, my name is Quentin Walston. Uh, I'm a composer, a jazz pianist, and a music teacher. So I uh, kind of try to do do it all, try to, I guess, do music full time <laughs> is the best way to put it. Do it full time and pay the bills and stand on your that's own right. two feet. That is the goal. That is, you know, that's a fantastic place to be. So that is the artist's dream, right? There, that is the so. dream. So many, many hand claps, many salutes to you, sir, that you've accomplished your goals and your dreams. Um, I appreciate it. Well, it's 2020. The world's yes. falling apart. How have you been? How have you uh, managed to I, keep going in in this unpredictable time? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess, yeah, the world has, has fallen apart. Oddly, I mean, my, my year has been pretty well, uh, pretty good. Melissa and I moved into a, a new house we're renting uh, up in, in Waterford, Virginia. Um, we're, we're expecting our first child in three weeks and I just premiered a suite. So oddly 2020 has been, been really good to me. Um, but yeah, I guess in, in general for, for music, it's taken a hit. I would say I've had to adapt strongly um kind of twice this year i've had to radically uh reconsider what i want to do within the the music spectrum because in the beginning of the year i was working on um a chamber music suite a through composed chamber music suite kind of juxtaposed juxtaposed outside of jazz a little bit mm -hmm. like used a little bit of jazz language but nothing was like swung eighth note or anything and I was writing um, that for, uh, for, let's see, five instruments. It was cello, bassoon, um, tenor saxophone, uh, clarinet, and how am I forgetting the other one? And piano, duh, that's what I play. <laughs> and uh, it, it was five movements based on works of art from local artists. So each one was kind of written to the work of art and it was all pastoral or pastoral art so it was going to okay. be this pastoral and that was really i was getting really invested in that realm of composition not as much performing so at that time and, and this um was like january it was a three-month residency um sponsored by the the loudon arts council and their library programs. I was like the artist and resident at this library. Congrats. I was writing for about three months and we're planning to premiere it in March. And I was getting this mindset like, okay, maybe I'll just move more towards being that type of composer. I was looking into orchestral writing, like really doing a lot of research in orchestral writing and learning those things all again. Cause I've been familiar with writing for big band but never for like a straight up orchestra right so and right. i was talking to i was talking to conductors and stuff like that like all right this is what life is going to be like um and then COVID hit and conductors were like we don't know if we're ever going to go back to a traditional um program 
or in performance and and when that would be so that was one heavy shift so like that then i had to shift back because before i was like in the mindset of okay 2020 i'm gonna go and and be uh like a commissioned composer and then and then covid hit and i was like okay i'm not gonna do that oh no, yeah <laughs> um and then I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to perform very much. I had some, I mean, I was, I was super fortunate. I hadn't had a lot on my book yet, like on my, on my calendar. So you, so you didn't have to reschedule a lot based on COVID. You were pretty much a blank slate. Yeah. Yeah. Much closer to a blank slate. Cause during that time that I was writing the, the suite, I hadn't, I wasn't booking gigs. I like, I stopped booking like winery gigs and stuff like that. A lot of those easy, like, um, weekend, weekend Friday gigs, night yeah. things, especially where I live gigs in Northern as a, Virginia. As a pianist. Yeah, definitely okay. as a pianist. And, and when you guys said like, congrats, you, you did it. I feel very fortunate that I am a pianist. Cause like being any, anything other than like a rhythm, or like a like a rhythm player it's so hard to get solo gigs like i mean i can't imagine being a trumpeter and trying to do a solo gig one probably people venues might not hire that because they haven't heard of it and two you'd like destroy your chops right <laughs> like, right yeah. right no it seemed like you know the lonely trumpeter outside the new york subway or That's you know was metro, yeah. metro station uh but it uh when you're saying solo um instrumentalist it made me think of the uh christmas episode of the office where they didn't they didn't hire a full jazz yes. court they just hired the bass player <laughs> for like six hours six, which i don't i mean i don't have a problem with that man i, I, I love walking bass like it's walk great. yeah no walk up and down that <laughs> neck man but um i'm so glad that you've been able to um you know have a have a better you know um time with this than most and yeah being a being a keyboardist does really um yeah help because you know you're you're your own rhythm and melody section. yeah yeah super blessed by that i was also super blessed that i was able to continue teaching with my full studio essentially so that so that's been the main driver through keeping my head above water um is i have like I always keep above 20 students and that's through the Katakin school of music, which wow. is like an after school of music, um, 20 school students. In how, yeah, how do you yeah. do it? How do you do it? Um, 20 kids. That's to me, that sounds like a lot. 20. At yeah. Once. No, no. I, well, I do teach a couple classes. I teach some like uh, composition and theory classes for different age groups. And that the, the biggest I've ever had in one class was 11, I think. But most of my lessons are one on one, half hour. Okay, my youngest so it's, it's, is five. It's not twenty as a group. Oh, I, oh, I know that. I okay. mean, just you know, keeping up individually with twenty kids. Yeah, and, no, I thought you meant yeah. like twenty as a group, and I was just no, like, no, he can't do that. He has to go over Zoom or Google. I yeah. guess. I guess you're doing Zoom yeah. or Google. Yeah, I'm. I'm doing Zoom, um, which has been really, really helpful. I mean, all of my students crossed over, went with me, which was awesome i didn't lose anyone in my studio um and yeah i mean the the only thing is like sometimes you just wish you could like point to where you want them to look at on the page right because right. there's a lot of times where it'll be like all right measure 13 no measure 13 no on the first page no no three lines down no that's four lines down <laughs> three, three yeah it's like just awful um but that's pretty much the worst part. Everything else is pretty, pretty that's, simple. That's, that's fantastic. Not, yeah. I, I don't know a lot of people that can say that in the creative world. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I feel, I, I, I really feel for those people. I had a bass player friend that lost like three grand in gigs as soon as the, like I've already booked gigs, just like poof, gone. gone. Yeah, so. that, that had to cancel because of occupancy and stuff like that yeah that's wild yeah, it, 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 yeah absolutely so we've talked to a friend of mine also from jmu who he transitioned uh right before covid to being a painter full-time and, oh, wow. and his silver lining was that people are stuck at home more and so now they're redecorating and hiring you know hiring yeah. him to paint stuff and buying paintings so it's really cool to see creative people um 
thrive in the midst mm-hmm. of all of this all of this craziness um did your did your like mental health or creative process take any of a hit when everything started to go down back in i guess may um i i don't so i don't i don't think so but part of that was i was in kind of this like call to action phase like my wife was in the first trimester and we were moving so it's like i was oh. like too busy and there's too much stuff going on for me to like afford to, I don't know. It's like one of, not, not like, um, not like emergency or panic, but just like very like pragmatic, very driven, like, all oh, right, I got to do this. Like th- I have to pack up this house. And like, so you had no, other option. I was able to keep busy. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. No, no other no, option. No other option. Um, well, I'm glad everything has worked out for you, but I, I, I really want to talk about what I want to talk about next, which is jazz. Go yes. for it. We're going to talk about jazz. I saw La La Land. Right, Does that right. count? You saw what? I saw La La Land. No, Does it count? doesn't count. It doesn't count. I have, I, have, I have not seen La La Land. <laughs> well, it's good. It's a modern era musical with Brian Gosling and Emma Stone by the guy that did Whiplash, and that's about it. There you go. I did see Whiplash. Yeah, it's by the guy that did Whiplash. So Okay. Nice. I watched it as a film as a film person because it got nominated for a shit ton of Oscars. Right. Um, and I don't I, want to talk about this. Isn't jazz? La La Land's not jazz to me. <laughs> Nate. No, I don't give a shit. That's my jazz experience. I know that's your jazz experience, but we're gonna talk. Okay. <laughs> now ex- expose me. Okay. So. Quentin, see, like he's not exposed to jazz, but when most people think of jazz, what do they think about? Because I have I. When if I was a layman and I didn't know anything about jazz music and jazz history and stuff like that, I just go to big band. Do you want big my, band you want to me band? would yeah. be? Do you want, do you want, do you want. I, I, when, for me, there, there's like three things that people think of when they hear jazz, and yeah, one is either big band or like crooners, like um, Frank Sinatra and and all those guys, and I think that's just like pop culture. I mean, like we're like even like Family Guy and stuff. Like when they jazz, they're like going to big bands and show tunes or like maybe because high school like that's the other only time you hear about jazz is kids that are in the high school jazz band right so like that that's one aspect when people think of jazz they hear they think big band the other one is people think kenny g like smooth jazz yeah (laughs) yeah i think walking Um, the bass lines and elevator music yeah the elevator music pretty much and then um occasionally people will think like dixieland like i remember like just when i got no i was thinking, i think i was still in college i was trying to get a gig at a winery um and they had a piano there so it's like awesome i don't need to bring my gear and i sit down and i play like a, i play like night and day or something like a like a ballad for her because like all right jet wineries people love like listening music stuff in the background and she's like that's not jazz it was like it took me by so like by such surprise. I didn't know how to respond. Just like someone telling the jazz musician, "That's not yeah." Anyway, did you pull out your copy of Ken Burns Jazz and say, "Honey, <laughs> time to sit down and watch"? <laughs> yeah. no, I was like, I'm gonna "Call Chuck Dotis." Like, can you please talk now? <laughs> I'm calling my dad. No. <laughs> so. Uh, sometimes people when they hear jazz they they think like ornette coleman just like free jazz like people screaming through their instrument kind of thing but i guess all this is to say that a lot of people don't know what jazz jazz is i don't know then then tell us what 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 is your interpretation of the genre and or idiom if quentin molson was to say what is jazz then what is jazz oh that i mean that's I, part of me wants to say that it's improv, like it, like it, I, I can't say it's just improvisatory music because there is so much improvisatory music that falls outside of the jazz idiom. I do think that jazz has to, in some way, be tied to its history, like its its common language. Because jazz a lot is the of first times, truly American musical form, right? Yeah. Well, like a high art musical form yeah so like we we invented the blues in america um and like there are certain types of like bluegrass bluegrass really pre- was after jazz bluegrass is but you don't hear bluegrass century. playing with big band orchestras 
<laughs> but hey, banjo was in a lot of early jazz. Right, Dixieland, like, yeah. Did it... Before before guitar, um, banjo and ukulele. So, so high. I don't know. Highbrow so, improv music. Highbrow improv music. Because like, there's so much stuff that's jazz now that isn't swung. Like if like a pianist that I really like is Aaron Parks and like just monster players, really beautiful writing, but like they barely ever play straight ahead, but it, it's still jazz and it's still born of that, like that lineage and you still hear it in their harmonic language. Like, could you explain it, it might, swung to the audience? So just like, so a normal swing pattern would be like where every other note is short or versus long. So like a long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Um, hey. So just like da, 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 da. We were wondering so if you were going to play for us at all. There we go. We, we were wondering little... that. And I was just like, oh, is he going to, does he have his keyboard around? Does he have his keyboard? I and do. yes, he does. I yes, do. he does. Um, we might have to ask you to take us out on this episode, if you don't Ooh. mind. Oh man! If you don't mind, but not yet, but not yet. Um, we got time. We got pl- we got a lot of time. Um, there you go. So, if that's jazz, and in, in to you, then is a play. Oh, so as a as an instrumentalist, what is the most important thing to you as a player? Is it your voice? Is it how you approach the instrument? Is is it your your um, you know, timbre, tone. Yeah. Like oh, how, man. what, what makes a jazz musician a jazz musician? That That's so tough. Like, they're, cause they're, they're, well, one, I, I feel like that, if, like each player would have a different answer. I think there's always a push and pull between playing for yourself in your own aesthetic and then playing for what you want the audience to hear. Like, and, and I feel like some of that has caused alienation between the audience because sometimes jazz is a musician's music. Um, like, like if I'm working on some really slick stuff and like, like just diminish language with implied triads and stuff like, or triads that imply diminished language, like the audience doesn't know that I'm doing that and that I've been working on that. That's for me, like I, mm-hmm. I want that sound and I, I like I have this concept in my mind of what I want my playing to sound like. And my goal in that moment is to try to execute that sound and have that come out in my playing. Now that's a very like selfish internal style of playing, but it's for the the end, it's the means to the end of creating what I think is good music. The other side is trying to make music that I feel that people will genuinely enjoy and genuinely um, like listening to and part of that has caused my writing style to simplify or be a little bit more accessible it can still have some of that complex stuff but like does it feel good does it groove things like that that before i was more like just all into the intellectual heady stuff and you could you could tell like you didn't have that like thing where you just want to sit down and listen to it so as far as to answer your question, what I'm really looking for, I think is probably a balance between that, like trying to realize that sound in my head that I want to capture and also present it in a way that's enjoyable to others, and digestible especially to yeah, yeah. people. Yeah. I really like what you, um, h- how you articulated, like playing what you hear in your head and actively working on that. Um, when you compose a piece, how do you find the balance between there? There's like a balance. I feel like artists that artists strike between like working actively working on something mm-hmm. and not making themselves miserable doing it. So like for me, if there's like a technique I'm trying to get out with my visual art, there are times where I'm just like beating myself over the head with this like technique, and I don't actually enjoy it, but it is mm-hmm. what I enjoy doing. How do you find that balance? In composition specifically? Well, just when when you're working on your technique, you know, versus just like playing a gig that you know by the back of your hand. Yeah, that, that's... that's uh, you weren't expecting are, these tough questions, weren't you? 
this well they're not on the list no this is great no i i, I love it um i think i on the technical side <laughs> yeah on the technical side i have a hard time with with mastery so like i've had a lot of or i had one really good piano teacher he's um he's at uarts in pa and in, in philly and he was saying like his whole thing is just mastering every single little element to the T. So then you have just super fluidity and fluency with your instrument. Like Bill Evans was one of these practicers that just like every single little aspect, like he would practice one specific voicing in all variety of contexts and all things like that. So then he could just use that voicing wherever he wanted. And I've tried that kind of playing, but I, I have a hard time getting um like moving on to other things so i feel like i have a lot of breadth so like um for instance there's like when i was talking before about diminished scale stuff there's this there's this scale it's called in the jazz realm a diminished scale in the classical world it's called an octatonic scale um it's built up of a half step whole step half step whole step half step whole step pattern now, within that scale, there are different triads. So one of my ideas is like, well, this would be really cool to, rather than soloing with just that scale, because in jazz, there's this chord scale relationship. When you're on a given, a given chord, you have a selection of notes that you can use to solo with that will imply that harmony. So I was like, well, wouldn't it be cool if I'm using that scale, but rather than just ripping through that scale, what if I instead use triads that are found in that scale? So I could do something like, um, like a... So it's, it's kind of this interesting out kind of thing. But while I was working on that and trying to really get that ingrained in my playing, I was listening to some McCoy Tyner and it's like, oh man, McCoy Tyner's use of pentatonics is awesome. And he, how he slides around pentatonic scales, like, um, like shifting them chromatically. So then I started working on that, but it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I haven't fully got that first thing in my playing. So when I'm working on technique, it's a lot of times like bouncing around, but trying not to let myself get distracted, but I inevitably get distracted. Um, but that's, then, a, that's inevitable. The, like, that's just human nature. Yeah. And I think being a musician, it's just you're always attracted to something new that your ears hear. And you're yeah. just like, oh, I got to do that. Oh, I got to yeah. I gotta see how to use it. I got to, you know, play that. And I guess it yeah. just comes down to, you know, discipline. Nate's big on discipline exactly. um, where I'm not. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah. But like with, yeah. And with Nate's question about, like, that, the, the, the th not the throwaway gig, but the easy gig, that'll be, like, like another back, like a background music gig. Like if I'm doing a winery or something where no one cares if I'm doing like strict bebop language versus out language. Like, yeah, I'll totally try those things out and probably fail, but you know what? That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Cause only, you know, that you failed and everyone else that's is going, right. Oh, that's a night. Nice, that's just a nice environment. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. Oh, he played fast notes. I like fast. Notes. I like fast. Notes. <laughs> Human music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um that's all that's another really interesting point. So like I remember the best critique. So I do personally I do a lot of pen and ink work. Um mm. and I remember I did an exhibit at uh at Pale Fire Brewing back in Harrisonburg. Um nice. and a buddy of mine invited a friend who's now uh someone I'm very close with, uh my buddy Joseph, who is also a pen and ink artist. And that's like the best critique I've ever gotten in my life because he's also versed in that mm -hmm. that specific facet of um of two D artwork. How do you separate like? I mean, because as creators, we're ultimately our own worst critic, and in a lot of cases, perfectionists. Mm -hmm. How do you separate a gig like that where it's like they don't know what they're talking about, but you still have to make it sound good? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Yeah. So it's like it's like they'll give you either either they'll give you a criticism or you have to kind of like let yourself go a little bit because like they if I mess up they don't know 
Like they're yeah. not paying attention, but I still want to make it sound good. Like, how do you find that balance? I think, um, like either way, I, I feel like I often play the same. I, I feel like sometimes I, I wish that people were, were listening or I'm not sure if, if people are listening. And I, I think I really value connecting with someone when I do have a gig like that. And there is someone that is listening, then I, I totally get in the moment and I'm like playing for that person. Um, and, and then I just like want to make that person happy and like play songs that they might recognize. So I'll do like fly me to the moon and autumn leaves and things like that. That one um, person's like, Hey, I know that song. Yeah. And yeah. Like, no. Well, oh man. What gets me so nervous is if like someone starts like clapping along with the beat or like snapping <laughs> or like, or, or, or dancing. Like then I'm like, Oh man, I can't screw this up. Like, like I gotta, I gotta be so on right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, like rubato, like... no rubato, no rubato, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, no. You can't take a, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've just now I just thing. literally forgot all my musical knowledge. I just remember the word rubato, and then I just that was it. I just vomited rubato That's out, good. and now I've literally forgot how to talk about music. <laughs> no rubato, no rubato is great, man. I played this. I once did like a five hour gig. Ooh, yeah. I hope you got great. paid very well. No. It was, <laughs> well, whoever hired Quentin needs to <laughs> cough up some more dough. He's just like yeah, it, no. it was like right out of JMU, like in the basement apartment, hustling, trying to play wherever I could. And yeah, my I didn't oh man. I played like Stella by Starlight for probably like twenty minutes. <laughs> just like stretching this out. Talk about Roboto, just like <laughs> just, just like improvised intro that has nothing to do with the song for four minutes then i started playing the song i mean all the greats have done that all the greats yeah. i mean from from bach to um eddie van halen r.i.p yeah, you know Jared would do that um i mean just you gotta you, you gotta make it fun at if, if you don't make it fun then why was it worth it that's right but, i mean yeah there is a paycheck involved but if it's not if you don't think it's fun and you don't enjoy it then why do it mm -hmm. um speaking of which i have another off the books question okay um so when you're doing like a commission i'm presuming that it's the same as 2d artwork where someone hires you to do a work um how do you articulate to someone you know, because they're hiring you because you're the professional. How do you, like, articulate? So for me, like, when I do a sketch, I can be like, this is what I'm thinking. How does mm -hmm. that work sonically? Like, how do you articulate to a new customer who presumably doesn't know anything about your type of music other than that they like to listen to it? Like, how does mm -hmm. that process work for you? Is there, like, a early on version of the track that you can, like, show to people, like, while you're working on it before you get too deep? Or... Um, I... I haven't done something where I've had to give someone like a work in progress. Um, I've had, I'll ask for like what they're expecting. Um, instrumentation, obviously that's crucial. Um, and length is important. Um, and then depending on the, the client, what type of music they want it to sound like or what song or artist they might want it to sound like. Um, like I, I did a piece for a viola choir, like, like it was like a, just a viola strict ensemble for uh, this school of music where I teach. So for that, it was like, okay, you want something jazzy, um, quotation mark jazzy. So it's like, okay, that's obviously going to be swung eighth note um for like four beats per measure like no jazz waltz kind of thing so like i'm already trying to match the idiom that they might have in their mind and i ended up picking something that was more along the lines of like a gypsy jazz kind of feel because i was thinking violas like that like stefan grappelli just that like jazz violin kind of sound so that was, was one thing i've done a commission for a student jazz combo where the person um, who commissioned me was like, I want this exact sound, like make this recording for my jazz combo. And that was, that was 
The only challenge with that was writing for to the ability level of the players, Ooh. which is which is really hard. That must have been really jazz. tough. How do you gauge that? For for some instruments, it's so much easier. Like for saxophone, it's just like okay, what range can they do, and how technical can they handle it? For something like pian like rhythm section, I think is so much harder to gauge because jazz piano especially. I know I'm clearly biased, but just the harmonic language, there's like, there's no faking harmonic language. Like, that's why like, I, like every single high school jazz, like jazz band j pianist I've taught, they're always so over their head because the jazz charts give, it might as well be like a college chart because all the harmonic language is the same. And unless a kid has practiced all of their voicings, no 14 year old is going to know how to pull out like a D flat 13 sharp 11. Like I still can't do that. Even yeah, I don't like know where would is. they get and that I, knowledge? And I took, I took some keyboarding. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's crazy. So like for, for that thing, I, I wrote out very pared down, but specific voicings, like three or four note voicings, um, much simpler rhythms, things like that just to try to approximate and, and include like a couple of nice color tones um not just like root position c7 chords kind of thing um with drummers you have to hope that they have like just a nice swing swing feel kind of thing and bass players is the same kind of thing where as the pianist like they need to know how to walk and if they can't, then you have to write out all of their walking lines, which isn't which isn't hard. And that's sometimes fun to write out walking lines for people. So, yeah. Cool. Well, cool, cool. Yeah, cool, 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 cool. cool. Yeah. Well, um, since let's let's get into your recent performance, sir. You played. Um, when was it? November seventh, correct? You host. Yes. There was a live stream hosted on Facebook. Um, mm. You and two other gentlemen. Um, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about that? Tell the audience about that. Tell us what you did. Yeah. What was it about? Awesome. Yeah, that was uh, that was a trio performance in uh, in Percival, Virginia, called the Franklin Park Art Center. It's this really awesome venue. Uh, it's really intimate, but it's a decent size. They have a, a piano there. It's one of those things where they like repurposed an old barn. So beautiful, like exposed wood beams and a huge vault ceiling. Um, so the venue itself is one of my favorites. Um, I, I mean, like I was like a kid when they were building it. I remember doing like a field trip there. So it's kind of been in my mind as my favorite venue for a while. Uh, and we returned there. I played there last year for my album release concert. And then, but this one was just trio. The album release concert was with my quintet. And this was um, with a different lineup too. So the drummer is out of Winchester, Virginia. His name's Daniel Kelly II, just monster jazz drummer. Just so much fun to play with. And uh, the bass player equally, just such a, a, a brilliant, um, has a brilliant handle on his instrument, upright bass. And uh, yeah, his name's Ben Rickoff. So the players themselves are just, uh, yeah, just over the moon getting to play with them. And it was a hybrid concert. So we did, we did up to 60 uh, tickets, in-person tickets, because the venue could hold, I think, around 280. So they would allow up to 60 there. And uh, we, we sold out the show. So that was awesome. Woo! And then, yeah. Woo -woo. And then we streamed the rest on Facebook, um, which was something new to Facebook where they're, where they're selling stream tickets. So that was kind of a first uh, for us. That's really cool. And the concert itself was really fun. I got to, um, well, well, first of all, we did an all original composition show, which I'd never done before. So that was a first. Really? Um, and we, yeah, we did wow. that because the uh the facebook the facebook has really strict rules about you have to get licenses if you're yep. going to do yep. other people's music so yep. normally with jazz concerts like most jazz concerts i've seen they'll they'll sprinkle in standards because that's kind of part of the the jazz canon to play standards and stuff 
Um, the exceptions I've, I've seen Wayne Shorter and like most of the time he just does his music. And yeah, that's just a crazy concert in general. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we did, I think three or four, of, or four of, I think, yeah, four of my tunes, two of the drummer's tunes, and then we premiered the new suite that I wrote for Jazz Trio. So, and it was like a 90 minute show, something like that. Yeah. So it, the timing worked out perfectly and it was just, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, high energy, high energy, high energy. It was, it was so cool. So is drum, bass and piano traditionally, mm -hmm. like when you say jazz trio, that's what you mean? Those three instruments? Yeah, yeah a lot of times uh, a jazz trio will be rhythm sections, but that that's not, always the case i mean there, there are people like sonny rollins who would play with like piano -less trios like there have been horn players that want that freedom that, that like without having the, the 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 chord the harmonic instrument to kind of lock lock them in you place you can't but tie me down that's right that's right but usually like a piano trio like a jazz piano trio would be bass and drums um there, there are cases where like the venue might not want a drummer, so then it'd be like bass and saxophone and stuff like that. But is that because of noise or space? Sorry, what was that? Is that because of noise or like space? Like as far yeah, as the drum goes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes like a restaurant, they. I mean, good jazz drummers can can control their volume. Um, a lot of times, it's a misconception by the the venue owner. Um, but if it is if it is like a space or a noise thing, you opt for something else. So talk to us about your suite you premiered. I had a chance to listen to it before this interview. Mm -hmm. um, it took it took me by surprise. I was thinking that it was going to be real. To me, it didn't sound as strictly jazz what jazz is. But can you like open that up? Because I, like, I thought the, the beginning uh, melodic line was, was great and mm -hmm. how you use that that was fantastic that was fantastic so yeah it, it wasn't I, I guess it kind of goes back to that early definition thing about jazz but it, it definitely wasn't um like straight ahead when you that term you just means like swing um so it wasn't like that real straight ahead or walking bass kind of thing yeah, yeah like, like i was i was thinking more like real up upbeat you know right so the uh, yeah, so I guess the suite, yeah, is four tunes, and it's it was in, inspired by scripture by two um, verses that have had a really big influence on me recently. Um, and each part of the suite was kind of this little snippet, so of of the scripture. So the they stand alone, but also can can form together. So like the first movement is called Fear Not. The second movement is called I'm With You. The third one is called um, Till the End. And then the last one is Of the Age. So and it, it's all together is Fear Not, I'm With You Till the End of the Age, which is a little bit of Isaiah, um, Isaiah 43, which is Fear Not, I've Redeemed You, I've Called You by Name, You Are Mine. And also like, when you go through the waters, you won't be overcome. Basically saying like, God's got your back. Don't worry, like if things go crazy, it's not going to destroy you. Like, like you are, you're going to be okay. And that was really helpful to me. Um, so like, this is our first pregnancy and not knowing if there's going to be any complications yeah. and just kind of yeah. getting all bent out of shape and anxious about that. Um, and then the other half comes from, well, after Jesus was resurrected, he says to his disciples, like, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Like another thing of, I have your back kind of thing. So, so that, that was the, the inspiration um, and each piece kind of came out on its own. Um, like the first one, or no, let's, yeah, I'll go in order. The first one, which is that melodic statement that you're talking about. I had, I had that written um, and we were having a rehearsal and and they're like, okay, is this everything? We wrap up because I hadn't finished writing the suite yet. And I was like, oh, well, I have this idea, but I don't know what to do with it because like it's incomplete. And, I, and at this time, I was really thinking about these hard contrasts 
because I, I, I love like this really, really huge contrast. Like I was thinking like, okay, what if I write a ballad and just have like drums go absolutely nuts during a ballad? Like that just, and that yeah. tickled me. Just yeah, idea. no, that's, that's um, great. So, so at the same time, I was listening to a uh, Miles Davis quintet album, Miles Smiles, I believe. And as this song Freedom Jazz Dance, where Tony Williams is just doing this like really triplety thing. And so I asked our drummer DK if he could do that. And then I would just start playing my little theme on top of him. And we just like played around with just that theme, just again and again and again and again. And DK was like, he wanted to be in five because he's a drummer. <laughs> and the bass players like I'm going to be doing some weird stuff with harmonics and I'm going to catch your melody every once in a while and it was just so cool and we're like and I was like well I don't need to write anything else like just this idea of like hyper um development like the whole tune will just be development on one single idea um and, and, and that's and yeah that's what it was yeah yeah no that like you that sums it up really well that that one idea just gets. That's why it's jazz. Expe- <laughs> okay, Nate. Okay, <laughs> I guess you get your uh, your gold star today. <laughs> then so then uh, I'm we, the we audience in this situation. It's like oh. movement, which was very um, very like groove pocket oriented, and that one was based on the, this little ballad I wrote when I was thinking about the crazy drum thing. Um, and it had like a lot, so yeah, that's just um, like. And that has a lot of um, like gospel music in it. Cause I, I play with my, uh, at my church and just like playing the hymns every Sunday, finding these cool little chord progressions. Just these like really pretty bass line and inversions. So I put a lot of that in the second one, um, which was fun, fun solos and things like that. Um, and we had the stop time, which everyone liked. <laughs> like holding anyway tension. Um, that tension. gotta hold that tension yeah yes. that's right that's right it reminds me of la la land <laughs> quentin you, you got you gotta god no no <laughs> quentin hold off just hold just <laughs> if anything hold it's a back. fantastic movie that's great <laughs> but guess they didn't win the oscar so <laughs> poo poo on them they didn't win the oscar well yeah neither did Downey jr for tropic thunder so suck it <laughs> Oh, this is great. How do you debate that? How do you how do you say di- never that we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. Um, I could talk about Oscar so, snub. So all keep, day please long. please keep going on about yeah. uh, about your suite. So the the third movement um, has like a lot of like anger in it, and it, it actually got a start because I got this this transcription book of Errol Garner piano solos. I brought actually like solo piano, like not just his right hand, but like. This whole like his little things um and he was came out of more of like the stride influence of piano where you're doing like the really active like the bouncy left hand kind of thing yes so and he had this really pretty minor one um and it was like d minor and, and it was but it was all that stride and i was like okay well i i want to write kind of something that's more stride oriented because i haven't written anything like that in a long long time and i also have this thing when i compose is that like i i have i don't want to write something that's already been written kind of thing right and i'm sure right. nate you as an artist are familiar with that like wanting something novel we talked about this in our last recording session from the day but it's like I, I recognize the supreme importance of being influenced by something. So there's always that duality. Like you don't want to do something just new for the sake of being new. But I also have like that feeling where it's like, well, if I wanted to sound like Duke Ellington, I would just listen to Duke Ellington. Can't go wrong there. Right. Can't go wrong. So, you know what you know what Monk said? You know what Monk said about Duke? 
Never goes out of style. There you go. There you go. Can't go wrong. The only thing I know. I took a lot from that class. I took a lot from that (laughs) class. That was one of the best classes I ever took in college. That's awesome. Is that is that Andy's class? Yeah. 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 I didn't. I didn't take Andy's class because I did Montreal. Um, I went. No, no. We were. You were. We were in the same class together on Monk. That wasn't Andy. That was Monk. Yeah. I was thinking of Andy's um, jazz history class. I did not take that. I wanted to take it, but no. yeah. Oh well. Gotcha. Um. But anyway, so like I, I wrote this like stride thing, but I wanted to do like a lot. All, all these chord progressions I was coming up with were like very expected, so I w- was like really seeking for harmony that was going somewhere else, but also kind of captured this this mood. of this dissonance kind of in there so and that was also like the first movement where we were just going to develop that like i tried writing melodies but it's like any melody i'm writing is going to take away from that bass that like angry bass feel so right kept that right and i let and i wanted dk to just go monstrous on that that we, we we had rehearsed that where it was just like 10 minutes of that (laughs) <laughs> wow it's like yeah and then when we were performing it i was i was definitely like feeding off the crowd and was like all right they're ready for us to go into something else <laughs> so which is good it was good to do that timing i don't like yeah so and then the the last movement everything just kind of gets wiped away and it's just this piano interlude um and we finally resolve the chords where you think they're going to resolve which is very refreshing you have this like e flat diminished going to a minor and i just use the same exact voicing in my right hand but i change the quality of the chord by changing the bass note and then change it again but every time my right hand's doing the same thing, so there's some of that unity in there. So that was just like really pensive, and that's somewhere that like I really wanted to draw the listeners in, and like also for myself, like it was, I don't know, like like not, not maybe therapeutic, but like just one of those like really poignant emotional things. And then out of that came this other this other kind of groove. A uh, straight eighth note groove. No, what is it? There. Some, something like that. So pretty chords, and we just kind of vamped on that um, for a while. Brilliant. It's 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 brilliant. It's brilliant what oh, you've done. You. It's fuck it's freaking that. brilliant. Um Yeah, everyone. If you don't know, go check it out on Facebook. It's still available. Yeah. And hopefully and, and I'm hoping the the money that you pay goes to you and to the other artists and to all at the uh please uh, remind me again the Franklin Franklin Park Art Center. Franklin Park Art Center. Thank you. Franklin Park Art Center. Um, let me let's go, let's let's dive into something that I don't know. It wasn't on the questions list, but I've noticed you have you've had it on Instagram. You've had a couple up. Your still life and your painting. Can you talk yeah. to us about that? Yeah, I've always been. Um, I guess. Uh, art like visual artistic minded as well and, and really enjoy it i i love uh oil painting like like actually like appreciating other oil painting i do it as well but like uh whenever i'm like in a city i don't know what to do in cities so i go to museums um i just love i love seeing oil paintings and uh just oil painting realism just captures my attention i love the brush strokes and stuff so as i like i did art um, and I've kind of been involved in art and like I did my album cover so I, I know a little bit about graphic design and stuff like that 
So I kind of took it upon myself that I really wanted to learn how that old master's process is um, with all the layers. Because I knew like that there's layers involved. My dad was uh, an artist too. And he would like explain to me like some of, um, is it Parrish, Maxfield Parrish? What, I'm, I'm going to drop his name, but there's like another, like one of these artists that has all these layers and stuff mm -hmm. and all, and all mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, the scumbling and the glazes. So anyway, I, I wanted to do that. And I had, I have a, a hat collection cause I'm a dork and, uh, I wanted, I wanted to paint my hat collection. So all right. I set up the still life, but I paint so infrequently that it takes years. <laughs> like, Does it? Really? Because yeah. it doesn't. It it to me the those those pieces don't look like they take years. They look like they take you know a uh, maybe a, a day of frantic work or like an afternoon. No, but some yeah. they come together beautifully. And uh, I, I think I started. You're a you're a Renaissance man, dude. You're a Renaissance well, I man. It. I really appreciate it. I, I just host. I just host a podcast. I don't you know. <laughs> I just host a podcast. Quarter life crisis. Here we come. No, no, you guys are awesome. You guys are too kind. It's um, yeah, I, I have two oil paintings that I've done. Like I did one of my family in Germany. Uh, they after I graduated JMU, I went to see my family in Bavaria for a few months, and they like housed and clo not clothed. They housed and fed me. No, they did clothe me. They bought me later hose, which is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I was just about to say, did you get a pair of later hose? I did. Do you it have a picture complete. of those? You I, in the later hosen? There's probably one on Facebook. Oh no man, doubt. I really, <laughs> I really want us to post that on our social. Media. Yeah, if you could track <laughs> down a copy of that, we will gladly post it for the social media. <laughs> I don't think Quinn would like us to do. That. I'll think about it. It'll, it's gonna get, it's gonna Wait, get is buried. He, is deep he wearing in. just the later hosen? Oh, well, it's the whole yeah, outfit. Just later it's the whole, you know, outfit, man. Oh, I thought the later hosen was just the stockings. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 so there are some that are just pants, but the kinds that I got are the ones that also have the like the like the, the overalls front with the the yeah yeah. So, wow. Anyway, wow. so I, I did an oil painting of their restaurant because they own a restaurant. And that one took me forever, and now I'm on the the hat painting. So. Yeah. I just you, you know you just <sighs> amazing, brilliant, just brilliant, pure brilliant. No. We know a, we know a guy that does hats. We do know a guy that does hats. We do that's the hat great. mafia. Him and the hat mafia. Oi, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah, we were we were talking to him about the uh, the underground hat market and all the drama. They're just a bunch of snowflakes, man. The drama that goes on with with that underground market. hat market. Okay, yeah, no, like we think we think you know all the uh, stories you hear about jazz musicians being crazy and stuff. <laughs> the hat world might take the cake on like I, the. I, it's I, like I Game of it. Thrones, but with hat makers. Like people are like backstabbing other people, and like you can't go to this person. And yeah, it's it's oh pretty wild. Gosh. It's that's crazy. It was I know, like hats used to make you crazy because of like the the lead the or lead. the mercury. The I think lead. it was the mercury. Okay, it was mer yeah, it was I don't know. It was something, something crazy. Yeah, but so he's he's we're trying to hopefully we can get him back on because he's going to talk to us about the history of hats. And how Ooh. different hats function, like from that. That'd be I. Be I am totally down to listen to that. When my wife and I went to Gettysburg for my birthday a few weeks ago, and I was like, I found that there. She was like, "Okay, what do you want to do? We're going to go to the battlefield. This and this and this." And I was like, "Babe, there's a hat store. There's a so hat store." We we totally went to the hat store, and I bought a hat, and that's the hat I'm wearing in the Franklin Park uh, concert. Heck yeah! Nice. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Heck yeah. That's one of my earliest memories in Richmond was buying a hat at that vintage store on Carey Street. And oh yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, still have the hat? I name? do. Oh good. Good. Nice. Is good. that this is that one of the vintage clothing stores or is it just like a hat only? No, it's a vintage clothing store over near Bird I, Theater. It's called Bygones. I think yeah, I think I got a pair of the like wingtip, like the white and black wingtip shoes there. I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. No no jazzer can go without wingtip shoes. That's right. Oh That's man. Right. Uh, this is great. <laughs> I love hats. I'm trying to. I'm so. trying to. I'm trying to think about where I want to go next. Or how much time do you have left, Quentin? Um, I don't know. I, I got time. Uh, how much? How much time do we have, Nate? 
I'm not super picky. You're not super picky? Okay. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's 30 let's talk favorite jazz LPs. All what right. is what is your go to? So my my favorite jazz album is Blues The Blues and the Abstract Truth by Oliver Nelson. I have never heard that before. And I need to get learned. It's uh I just love his his writing and how he solos like he's one of those like uh he's one of those players that doesn't just regurgitate bebop language but that sounds really rude he he um because there are players that i love that are just saturated in bebop language he can do bebop language but he solos like a composer or like an arranger like it's just incredibly thematic and um really really brilliant and a really interesting conservation of notes Kind of like how Duke Ellington solos, like just really unique ideas that isn't just focused on the eighth note line kind of thing. So can you can you I'll, play us an example? Yes, I can. Um, and that's why I'm we have the do, piano. Oh, oh man! Can you? Oh I yeah. I was gonna say I could play you play your recording, but I I can't. Um, I do not have any of his solos memorized, but. Let's see. No, no? <laughs> you oh, put man. me on the spot. I'm I thought sorry. I thought you were going to pull out some. By... If you could dig us up some links, we can put them in your uh, either yeah, in your bio or cool. in the uh, in the description for the episode. Um, for those, but what that... it does have on the album, it also has Eric Dolphy on alto sax, and Eric Dolphy is like this crazy out player. Like he, like everything he played was outside of the changes, but also inside of the changes like it was very logical like it wasn't like he was just playing wrong like quote unquote wrong notes on purpose like he had um an absolute reasoning behind it there was a direction the the whole album is either all the solos are either on a blues form or on rhythm changes which is the the chord progression or, or modified chord progression from george gershwin and like so there's this one they're doing like a blues which is just like a really straightforward F blues or something and he starts off with this like crazy tritone run like on alto like and it's just like the wildest thing because you just you're coming out of this like really traditional sounding saxophone or piano solo or trumpet solo and then like what what year was this it was early 60s, I want to say. I want to really? say like 61 or something, but really? don't quote me on that. So how would you, when I hear blues, I hear like like B.B. King and Bo Diddley. Like mm. when you say blues in relation to a jazz musician, what does that mean exactly? In jazz, it, it's t- talking very specifically about a, a chord progression. Okay, Often that's, that's what I figured, but I just wanted to... Yeah. double check yeah yeah but thanks for the or asking for the clarification i know i've probably been using so much vernacular that's very jazz specific i've been um but yeah so it's just a, a 12 bar progression that has certain landmarks in it but over decades and stuff different composers have embellished it in different ways like a charlie parker or a, a bird blues as it referred to would be different than the way like John Coltrane would play a blues or, or Wynton Kelly would play a blues. Is that, have you found that different genres like that are geographically based or does it tend to center around a single person that pioneers one and people that follow them in their schools of thought? I, th- uh, I think Ooh. yes and no. I think Ooh. less so now the geographic base just because of the internet, like, the internet and stuff <laughs> like that. But like, but it still exists in some places. Like I would I, like the way you play a blues. If you're like a new Orleans pianist doing like the, uh, <laughs> like that kind of like Mardi Gras blues is not going to be, something like, like kansas city yeah yeah and then kansas city has blue like and some of these are really like antiquated idioms that are that are archetypes um that still exist and still persist but i mean like kansas city blues you're like thinking like count Basie orchestra and like all that kind of stuff um does but, everything just get effed up when it goes to california everything just gets screwed up <laughs> 
Yeah, just everything in general. Just <laughs> does the bl- is there just it just just doesn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> I'm thinking about moving to California. So like so, like Charlie Parker. I mean, like the and you could also see how eras affected the blues, perhaps more than geography. So like the bebop era was all about like harmonic intricacy, like packing in chord changes, and and so like what Charlie time Parker's what time blues, period was that? Could you place us temporally? That'd be like 1940s. And okay. then, and then, like, into the first half of the 50s. Like, post-depression. Um, and there were, like, still players that were really playing bebop while the rest of jazz was moving on to hard bop and other kind of things. Just, like, in art. Like, there, there is still, like, pop art people probably, like, in the 80s, even though that was kind of passe by then. Um, but what anyways, was, yeah, um... bebop blues are just filled with chord changes and stuff like that. Um, but then you get like the whole boogaloo thing in the, the, the sixties, kind of like the straight eighth. Uh... Like that kind of like Ray Charles or Charlie like, Brown. Uh... That's the, that's the <laughs> Charlie like Brown that. theme song. Or like, like Herbie Hancock, <laughs> like watermelon man, things like that. So, and so this, this is all changes. predominantly like American. Yeah. Yeah. Your European jazz is really cool. Um, it just, it's very, it's hard to just not just say it's very European. Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems more like chamber jazz. Like I would call it like chamber jazz. Cause like it's, it's not often swung. They're a little snootier um, with their jazz. Yeah. My follow up question <laughs> was what was Europe doing this whole time? So if you could unpack that a little bit, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Europe has always had a really huge appreciation for jazz. Um, like just really, really good following. So like in the the thirties and the forties and stuff, there was like the hot club jazz, like, um, Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli in the fifties. So that's, that's kind of evolved into its own thing. Um, I'm not super knowledgeable on exactly what Europe was doing um i know some artists spent a lot of time in europe like um like what is it dexter no not dexter gordon sunny rollins went to europe for a while um so i mean there's there's always a scene there or, or appreciation there um but now i mean yeah there, there's so many players that are doing things that have stretched the genre so much that it gets increasingly harder to define what jazz is, um, which is why I have a trouble saying it's just imp- improvised music because it's there's definitely improvised music that isn't jazz. But like, I don't know, a lot of a lot of European jazz will have really talented instrumentalists that are doing very um, complex, um, like harmonic sounds, like a lot of things that sound not necessarily atonal, but maybe more impressionist. And um, yeah. I don't, I, I don't want to speak outside of my knowledge base in case some some like killing German jazz pianist is like, whoa, what's up with the disrespect? Hang, hang on a minute. Let's Chanel, uh, Chanel, what is he doing? What is he doing with our jazz? Hans. <laughs> Hans, yes, Hans, what is he doing well, with our there, jazz? There is a killing jazz pianist named Hans Ludemann who's like Chick Corea, like on steroids, like just... <sighs> Everything he plays is ridiculously technical, Oof. but also ridiculously like edge edging on tonality, like just right on the edge of tonality wow. kind of thing. And yeah. is what is next for jazz? What is next for jazz? I think jazz is gonna um, continue to develop and in like. One, I think there's there's always going to persist the the style of jazz genres that have been like people are still playing Dixieland jazz. There are still swing bands. There are still people that detest anything that isn't straight ahead swing. Um, and I think that all of those people have good reasons. Like Wynton Marsalis gets crap all the time for like being a sellout or something. I think Wynton Marsalis is awesome because he's like really preserved. Um, like swung jazz but has also done amazing things with it like the the suites that he's written and he wrote a mass and like and he uh will write things he wrote a celebrating composer mass 
Like Catholic yeah. mass? Yes, like a Catholic mass, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um, that was a big so thing. So I think like as far as what's composers. next for jazz, there's all Oh, sorry, what was that? No, I was like I was trying to teach I was just trying to tell Nate that was oh. a big thing for like classical composers. That's like a thing to yeah. do is write a mass. Yep. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Um so I think for jazz there's always going to be people that are seeing what else tradition has done. Like in visual art like um art that's immediately presenting a recognizable object is always going to be there. Like there's always like the whole hyper realism movement is fascinating. And like, I think that's awesome. Like that might not be something that someone saw coming in the twenties. Um, so I think there's always going to be areas of jazz that are rooted in its fundamental history. But I also think jazz is going to continue to develop in new ways with different taking like taking on different influences like the amount that jazz has taken on like pocket beats and like hip-hop beats and stuff like that is surprising like i i didn't think that jazz would have done that but i think it's awesome that it has what is your opinion of electronic artists using jazz influenced music and what do you think that what impact do you think that has on younger audiences i think it i think it's cool to get people listening and like realizing what jazz is because as we like started this interview like so many people don't know what jazz is or they have a very very specific conception of it or perhaps a misconception so like if, if electronic artists are like sampling killer like trumpet solos or sax solos i think that would be awesome um with the whole electronic music thing uh, I, I think music in general needs to, or perhaps audiences need to appreciate instrumentalists, like people that actually have, like, are skilled with their craft. I think that's one thing that jazz has and has always had and will continue to have is people that are just pursuing their instrument, like creating something with things that they're using their fingers or their breath or anything like that to do. So I hope that if jazz continues to spill out into other areas, there will still be that appreciation that someone is creating in real time. This might be a, uh, a one-off question, but it also might segue into something else. I have no idea. Um, so when I'm, when I'm drawing, a lot of the times I'll listen to like movie scores. Mm -hmm. Um, and I noticed that with the exception of possibly John Williams, a lot of music right now is super, uh, simple and it yeah. doesn't have much of a complex instrumentation to it. Um, when you're like watching a movie, does the music ever like take you out of it? Are you ever like analyzing like that side of it? Can we blame Philip Glass for that? <laughs> probably he did uh, uh yeah i mean th th yeah there, there's Space a lot Odyssey, right there, there's a lot in that question like music definitely i think has simplified i, I think i want to an article like is is the is a is the uh, the idea of the melody dead because if you look at like what popular melodies were like it, like just the turn of the century all the like all the jazz standards are popular songs that's why like that's why jazz musicians played them because people recognize these songs for like Cole Porter and stuff. And like great American oh, songbook, the Cole Porter song be popular now, like with how hard the melodies are to sing. I mean, even Beatles songs have some pretty hard melodies to sing, like stretching outside of an octave, like modern music does is pretty confined. Um, so I don't know. I mean, cause at the same time, the suite that I just wrote one movement was based on like, a two bar melody and another movement that didn't even have a melody. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. So, but with the, with your question about being drawn out of a movie, some movies will absolutely capture my attention and that will make it worth the movie almost like, um, Nate Can you Smith's give us an example? Drumming, uh, Nate Smith's drumming on Birdman was just or no no nate smith no sorry he was the one that was filmed drumming but he didn't write the score i need to wait look up or you guys can put in the, the thing that's that's my name 
That is your name. That is my. That's, wow. It took me a second. I was like, oh, wow. he's, he's not talking about me. That's why wow. that was funny. <laughs> wow. Um, can we get him wow. on the podcast? I'm going to look it up so I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mess, mess it up. The guy that does the jazz drumming for Birdman with uh, Michael Keaton? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think we our um, our next uh, um, booking has just arrived, um, so we might need okay. to wrap this up a bit earlier. Uh, I do apologize. No I mean, I we have apologize. no worries. Going for but yeah, I mean, yeah, good music would definitely capture capture my attention. Um, tastefully done. I get. I I think strings like just really lush orchestral string writing for movies is kind of it's not I, I, it doesn't don't do much for me okay i was just gonna say where is it these days i'm like movies in the 30s 40s 50s yeah. 60s you yeah, like the huge but I mean, it, and... yeah but it's still there but in like weird like minimalism things like the like that's the, the word i was looking for minimalist philip glass yeah. is a minimalist yeah i think so, you, you can thank Hans i don't know I, I i get i <laughs> I enjoy different types of instrumentation in film scores. Also, if, if like if a, a filmmaker selects other people's music tastefully, like I think Quentin Tarantino has always done a good job of picking songs for his for his movies. Um, like oh, what was it? Death Proof, I remember was was a really cool one. So yeah, that's one of his yeah. that I haven't seen. That and Jackie Brown, I don't think I've seen yet. I've seen Death Proof. I've not seen Jackie Brown yet, but yes, I believe the um, Pulp Fiction uh, mm. album for the movie has gone uh, quadruple platinum. Are you shitting? Oh my me? gosh! I I just heard that in a in a that's why in a podcast, uh, another podcast that I listen to, um, No Dogs in Space. They cover a lot of like punk bands and stuff, and they were talking about um, they did an episode on Surf and Bird. And supposedly that that's in either that or something about surfing and birding and is in Pulp Fiction. They said that it's gone like quadruple platinum in America, in Europe, all over the globe. Yeah, that's wild. That's crazy. He he picks good music. He has great taste in a lot of things. He is a visual graphic designer. He's a visual. (laughs) He's graphic. (laughs) He's graphic visually. Yes. Yes. Well, no, but he he's a good like compiler. Yeah, like he orchestrates things together in a way. Yeah, that yeah. Is, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um. So, Quentin, do you have any, um, by lieu of uh, final words, do you have any like pieces of advice for someone that's either starting to learn an instrument or starting to get into uh, composition specifically, like something that you would like to pass on to a young impressionable audience member? Should they be yeah, listening to this uh, podcast? Yeah, composition just like anything else in music needs to be practiced a lot. There's a big misconception out there that like composition is an innate talent. Um, but you, it's Who's not going to be, yeah, you're not going to be good at it unless you do it a lot. Like I know for me, like in the bookshelf behind me, I have like, like this thick of just like manuscript paper books that have been filled with a lot of really bad music that I've written. So it, yeah, it needs, it needs to be practiced and developed. So if like, if you're interested in composition and you have written like a tune or two and you're really discouraged because you don't think it sounds good, that's totally okay. Just keep, keep writing. going. Keep going. Yeah, exactly. Keep going. So. Do you well, have any, uh, aside from the notion that composition is innate, do you have any pieces of advice you hear in your industry that's spoken all the time, but it's actually just, just not good advice? <laughs> uh... That's one of my favorite questions to ask people, and I don't think I'd forgive myself if I didn't. Uh, s- s- advice that that is not good. Um, shite advice. Complete you don't shite. Have to move, you don't have to move to a city to be a successful musician. I feel like a lot of people. That's think a good like, one. That's a good one. Go to, yeah, you need to go to New York. Or you need to go to Philly. Or you need to go to L.A. So your your correction is that you don't have to move, but the advice is that you should be in a big city. Yeah, okay. and I, I understand that there are like different networking opportunities, but I don't like cities. And like, like you're you're in your own big pink, dude. <laughs> you're like when Dylan said, "I'm I'm done. I need to go. I need to go off and there you know you create." Yeah, so, cool. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been very fortunate to be able to 
like I said, to, or I, I've been very fortunate to be able to do uh, music where I am and how, as, yeah, as long as I've been. So that's awesome. You, you, sir, you're very humble. You're too humble, sir. You are too humble. <laughs> you are too damn humble. And I'm just too most, damn pretty. Most artists are. No, I'm not. <laughs> but I just wanted to put that in. Oh, God. Okay. It's getting late. It is getting late. It's almost past my bedtime, probably. Oh, man. Just, oh, you know, man. getting old. Turn 28. Right. Dude, I turned 28, too. One of my friends was like, oh, man, you're in your late 20s now. When's your birthday? No mid-20s. It's like, thanks. When's your birthday? What was that? When's your birthday? Uh, October 24th. Yeah, ours is the 8th and 10th. So, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. You guys did have recent birthdays. Yeah, right. we're both twenty eight as well. So welcome, welcome to the club. All right. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a real fun ride for me since <laughs> turning twenty eight. Let me tell you that. Um, well, sir, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming thank on. You guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you and talk jazz with you again and talk about your work. Um, I am here also. And <laughs> thankful for Nate's, it. Nate's in the room too. Yes. Yes. I am, I am also. Here. I hope Nate has learned something. <laughs> yeah. And I, I hope he gets into jazz. I mean, I, I did know that jazz was improvisational, but I didn't know if there were any other uh, structures around it um, that can, like, because, like you said, there's improvisational music that could or shouldn't be considered jazz. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Well, we can go more into form and structure the next time. Hell yeah, yeah. we're running. We have we have a running tally on people that we would like to have back. So welcome to the, welcome to the short list. Welcome, welcome to the frame. <laughs> this fam, sir. The family oh, is ever growing, and we hope it keeps growing. And we hope people out there want to come and join us and talk and hang out. And right. um, yeah, Nate, any final words? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I I had a really good time. Um listening to you two nerd out a little bit so <laughs> good music's good music you know i hope you guys don't have to like put a glossary with all of the music jargon that i use well we we Probably. do we do that's post. actually not a bad idea yeah it, we like, do educational posts we like to you know inform people about like what that person does and you know something if you don't know yeah, about it yeah, we like that to would be, that would be really fascinating uh, oh man, there's a lot of terms. <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of jazz terms. There's a lot of well, jazz slang, dude. So since this is on video, we could have like a little like bing, a bing, oh, Ooh, like, like, like a little like cross the button, yeah, a little like new new definition, new definition. Okay, instead of nerd alert, it could be word alert, word. Like, like on History Channel. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. As long as it's not aliens. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no. We haven't we haven't come across the art of. Uh, uh, alien uh, exploration yet, so we'll put okay. that in the back burner. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna wrap this damn thing up. Um, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in, uh, listening, uh, watching us at home. Uh, thank you, Quentin. Stay you hungry. Awesome. Yeah. Stay, yes. Stay safe. Stay uh, safe. Stay hungry. There. Stay creative. And Quentin, would you like to do the honors of taking us out, sir? Sure. I'll I'll do my uh, my sweet. Bye, everybody.